The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONT's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. That's Malik Hill. I'm Joey Tysick, and we are already in June. Took a week off last week. Malik just uh, wasn't feeling it. So uh, here we are a week later, which is fine because the summer we know is a little slow with uh, Detroit sports and things yeah. like that. So there's not as much going on. If we came in and just talked about the Western Conference Finals, I would have dozed off a few times. I'm, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was tired. I yeah, needed a little a little bit of a break. Yeah, so it it helps us get refreshed and everything. Um, adds a little bit more news, but um, we wanted to start off this episode because we missed it last week, and uh, unfortunately for the basketball world, we lost Bill Walton, one of the greatest uh, basketball like champions of all time. Going back to, he like won a bunch of like high school championships, I believe, too, or something. Um, I don't know how many, but yeah, he, he was one of the top players in the country going when he chose UCLA. Yeah, and then he wins at UCLA. Yeah, he he was like he was the end of that dominant, probably one of the most dominant basketball runs outside of the Celtics yeah. in the sport mm-hmm. when UCLA just ran off championship after championship, winning like eight or nine in a decade. Yeah. And then he brought a championship to Portland when he got to the NBA and then later won a later championship with the Celtics when he was kind of their, their sixth man. Um, so he's just a winner on every level. And honestly, just I think probably for younger audiences, he's like he would be the most underrated player of all time, potentially. I honestly think pe- he has become very disrespected in the basketball yeah. conversation circles i've been in mm-hmm. people do not it's like carl malone for other reasons <laughs> but also i've never as long as i've been alive watching and hearing people talk about basketball people just don't like carl malone yeah. and the way he played they just didn't like him and then people are like i wasn't alive to see bill russell i mean not bill russell bill walton number one number two i just didn't like the way he played and We'll get to the personality thing, but I feel like that's another part of yeah. some people just aren't a fan of the personality. Yeah, his personality is definitely very polarizing. Which, which is the, the huge second part of his life that's mm-hmm. all people know for the most part. Yeah. Um, he was definitely, he would definitely get, I hate to say the word annoying at times, but like he brought so much energy to the sport that sometimes it was almost too much. Uh, but you appreciated that he just had a love for the game and all the accounts that you hear like since his passing – or how when he would commentate or announce or analyze in between like sets or something, he would have to lay down because of all of his past injuries. Yeah. Like his legs just did not work basically anymore. Um, so it's wild the commitment that he had to the sport. And I think that is kind of the biggest part in uh, what should be respected the most about his career just in general. Yeah, so For a person like me that kind of likes that out there stuff with – Everything doesn't have to be cut and dry, regular yeah. analysis. And there were some nights where I couldn't go to sleep and I just happened to stumble into a Stanford-Colorado game mm-hmm. at 10 o'clock late on like ESPN or ESPN2. And you got Bill Walton in a tie-dye shirt just talking about yeah. doing peyote and marching through, marching through canyons. He did a lot of the, and the, like- the Grateful Dead and all types of just strange stuff. Yeah. And how it equals basketball somehow. He typically for like college, he would usually be at like the Maui Invitational or something yeah. like that. Um and yeah, he would do all the weird games. The best part too is it was just fun. Like even if you get a, tired of it at some point, it's fun hearing some of his stories that he just he just goes off on tangents and he'll be like, Oh yeah, that guy, his father and you're like, yeah. What the heck are we talking about, Bill? But Made it enjoyable, something different. 
for sure. Yeah, I, I appreciated it. And I am honestly a fan of what he did, did as a basketball player. Mm-hmm. Nobody's brought a championship to Portland since him. And he beat Dr. J to do it, so it wasn't, like, nothing to slouch at. Like, he beat prime Dr. J yeah. in the 70s to win a ring. Mm-hmm. The injuries completely derailed his career, and he somehow came back and was a sixth man of the year for Boston in their prime and helped them win another ring. Mm-hmm. Now, there there was a weird little stretch in, like, the 90s when he first started getting into commentating where he was, like, criticizing a lot of people, like yeah. the Fab Five. And I personally, I wasn't a fan of, like, his criticism toward mm-hmm. the Fab Five. But I, I love what he did talking college basketball. He was a great player. And, yeah. Honestly, probably one of the biggest music fans in terms of, like, the era of the 70s because I, I believe – they said he went to over a thousand Grateful Dead shows. I wouldn't doubt like, it. Like, have you seen the video of them honoring him at their concert at the Sphere in Vegas? No, I don't think so. They played a collage of like just pictures of him <laughs> with different bandmates over the years, just like for a four or five minute span hmm. while they played a song. It, it was pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. So, unfortunate loss in the basketball world, but um, he definitely left his mark, which is more than we can say. Um, other little news and notes. Pistons actually did something. They have a new they, basketball. They made a baby step. Yeah. Which is a step, I guess. <laughs> they have a new president of basketball operations. They grabbed Trajan Langdon from New Orleans. Um, okay. I'm okay with this. I, I know some people that are, like, upset with the move, and I, I have no idea how to feel about it yet. Yeah. Like, I don't know exactly what he did. In New Orleans, I would have to do a ton of research, and I don't feel like it. Right. Because the Pistons just ruin my mood anytime I think about them. But it, it's a new face. Yeah. And it seems like he's cleaning house for the most part. So mm-hmm. I I can't get mad at it. I can't have any real feelings of it so far. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. Like, I don't know exactly what he did with the Pelicans, but I like that the direction that the Pelicans have moved the last few years. And that. He is somewhat a part of what happened there. So I'm hoping that he can do somewhat of the same similar things. Um, he also is going to have somebody under him as like an assistant uh, basketball president. But uh, we don't know exactly who he's going to bring in, what's going to happen. But the first move that he did make was he sent Troy Weaver packing. Thank more of a baby, more goodness. than just a baby step. Yes. Thank goodness. Because if we would have had Troy Weaver on draft night, I would have cried. So that's a good start. Um, now, not having a GM come draft night if they don't have one yes. is going to be extremely awkward. I would like the but, role yeah. filled. What will that draft room look like? The yeah. war room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the the next big question, obviously, is Monty Williams. Does he stay? Does he go? I'm still a little indifferent as much as I don't didn't like what Monty did last year. Maybe there's a way that he could still revive this team. I, I don't I, know. I don't see it. Okay. I don't see it at all. I think that's fair. I'm not going to argue with you. About I, it, I, I went along with it because he had such a good track record, but right. in retrospect, situations like this, he, he never really dealt with. Mm-hmm. He built with Chris Paul, but Chris Paul was the type of player that could put a team on his back when he was younger yeah. in those New Orleans days. And they had a good roster around them to make playoff runs. It seemed like Monty was checked out for a lot of the season and kind of just went along with what management wanted. And he's a Tom Gores guy, which is a complete negative. Yeah. And Tom Gores seems like he's not selling the team anytime soon, which still has the te- the franchise in a bad place. Yeah. So if you can get Tom Gores' guy out of here, I would be extremely happy. Mm-hmm. That would put a smile on my face. Yeah. Yeah, the other one that you hear about, too, is um, Arn Tellum. A lot of people are not super happy with him just because there's a lot of players on this team that are um, Arn Tellum connected clients. to him, Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't feel super great. Um, so that's another one that maybe you look at. I don't know. Um, again, that's something we are going to get Chris on, and we're going to do a poll breakdown at some point. Um, I'm almost thinking it. It probably is after the draft and maybe looking into free agency. 
so that we get a, a fuller picture of what we're working with. Um, and then in the next couple weeks, the draft is at the end of this month, or is it the first week of July? I think it's the first week of July. Okay. So we still got a couple it's, it's weeks. It's in that area, last week of June, first week of June. It's in that space. Yeah. So we still have a couple of weeks before we even start talking about any of that. The one thing that I did see is that one of the top prospects, Topich, did you see he tore his ACL? Yeah. Um, he was like a projected top five guy in this draft, yeah. honestly. Not really towards the Pistons because he's a point guard. He's a bigger. Well, is he I, bigger? Listen, or? I, 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 the Pistons could use anything to me. <laughs> Nobody is out. I I've gotten to the point. We haven't discussed this. Nobody is out of reach with me. Yeah. Anybody can go. Anybody can come in. As if you can, like contribute to winning. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I I don't care at this point. Yeah. And I like Nikola Topic, but yeah, who knows where he'll be after this injury? Right. And I've already shared my views of what we should do with the draft to you personally, but we'll save it for the podcast for later weeks. Yeah. Just as a short, I'd pick the best person in my opinion. That's yeah. as far as I'll go. Yeah. In the messed up position you're in, even though this is a weak class. Mm-hmm. Right. So we'll get there when we get there. But at least the Pistons are getting somewhere. At least of, of resetting, unfortunately. All right. So, oh, let's bring up the last uh, NFL news just because then we can get into the playoffs. Um, NFL, Justin Jefferson is now the highest paid wide receiver in the NFL. He got was 4 years 140 with 110 million guaranteed. Yeah, he's the highest paid no, highest paid non-quarterback in the right, NFL. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um and so he's about 35 million a year, which is insane. Um congrats to you. Did he only play 8 games last season? How many games did he play? Um He was out for like a chunk cuz he played what he played like the first week or first 2 weeks. And he got hurt, and then he came back late. Uh, yeah, it it's, might have yeah. only been like half the Point season. Point is, he played like half the season. Mm-hmm. He had 60 catches over 1,000 yards and like six touchdowns. Yeah. In half a season. Mm-hmm. Well, and to be fair, he started off on a tear with Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Um, and then when he came back, Kirk Cousins was out. Um, so that was kind of the yeah, other he, problem. He's one of the few guys, like no matter who the quarterback is, mm-hmm. they had Nick Mullins in there, and they – almost beat the Lions. Yeah. Because he made that catch to this day. I don't know how he made that catch on that, like, fourth and 20. Yeah. It was insane. And this year is going to be even crazier because he's going to have Sam Darnold, who yeah. uh, bridge quarterback hasn't really shown yeah, anything. Bridge guy. He's a placeholder until they think J.J. is ready. Yeah. And then J.J., you know, as much as you like him, obviously, everybody else well, has I, a lot. I don't know what type of pro right. he'll be. I said that when we did the draft. But everybody yeah. has a lot of questions about what J.J. is going to do yeah. for the NFL and how that offense is going to work. Having him is going to help a ton. But if they end up having a good connection, everybody's already talked JJ to JJ. I don't care. See, I was – It's so cheesy. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. yeah that's I, the whole thing. Forget that. Um, But this will be a good test for Justin Jefferson. And the scary thing is they already just paid him, so their test yeah. better work out. Can he do what DeAndre Hopkins did for, like, the first half of his career? Yeah. Where you got one good year of Matt Schaub, and then Matt Schaub died. <laughs> Whoa, don't say that. <laughs> and then Matt Schaub, his career died. Listen, I, Darren Williams died in in Cleveland. I, this is. Oh, boy. <laughs> when, you know what I mean. It. You know what I mean. Uh, yeah, I when do. Some, I do but... yeah, when somebody's sports soul just leaves, Yeah, that's what happened to Matt Schaub yeah. after a few good seasons in Houston. And then he had Brian Hoyer. Ryan Mallett was mixed in there. RIP Ryan Mallett. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just a mess. <laughs> See, that's the problem when and, you say that. Because you, <laughs> it's not funny, but that's the problem. You say Matt Schaub's <laughs> dead, and then you say rest in peace, Ryan Mallett. One of those things. That's is why true. I said his sports soul died. Matt Schaub, Gosh. his career died. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins was still unstoppable. Yes. No matter who the quarterback was, and no matter how poor the play was in that position. Can Justin Jefferson do that? Also, Tom Savage was there. Poor Houston fans for that stretch. (laughs) Tom Savage. They had so many quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, So now, CeeDee Lamb, uh, Jamar Chase, they're up on the docket next. Who knows how much they're going to – there's been talks about Tyreek Hill getting an extension, like a two-year extension for like 30-plus million. Do you think he didn't immediately ask for more money once that came out? 
But and still. he deserves it. He's he's unstoppable. I know, but like he, he's getting besides to that Justin point, Jefferson, he's about to hit his his thirties. He is so, but he hasn't slowed down at all. Makes you a little nervous. I maybe it's just me being naive. Yeah. To me, wide receivers have a long shelf life. I think it depends, especially when you have the type of gifts Tyreek had. Tyreek Hill has. Yeah. Like it, this isn't Todd Gurley like disappearing at the age of twenty five. Like when his knees just go bad out of nowhere. The only thing that scares me with like guys like Tyreek Hill though is they they have such a reliance on their speed, and not that he's not like shifty or anything, but he's not like a big receiver that you can age pretty well and just be able to go up and still kind of get past. Well, he's he's not tall, but I right. he's very stuff for like for being five nine. He's almost like two hundred pounds. He's built like a running back. Yeah, and he has that like track runner speed. Yeah, I I think he's a guy that could really last because hmm. speed doesn't really go away. It's the other stuff that, yeah, I don't think the speed goes away. We'll see. I mean, that's it, we'll we'll see. It doesn't doesn't fully matter, but it's interesting how much these wide receivers are starting to get paid. Um, and again, I'm waiting for a couple of days. I guess the other news and notes thing is we haven't really had any updates on Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk necessarily. There's been rumors that one of them could be ending up going to Pittsburgh. There's some talk about that. And they just drafted two receivers. So. Right. But we don't really know. So that's up in the air, which is a storyline to follow, especially in the next coming weeks. It should start um, developing more. And then still we don't know about T. Higgins, what he's going to do with the Bengals. But he hasn't been around. And I don't think Jamar Chase has it either, just as like because of contract. So. Yeah, a lot of little interesting tidbits that hopefully get resolved pretty soon so we can start to piece things together. But, yeah. Um, Soon we'll be back to football, though, because college football, as wild as it sounds, is not too far off. Yes, the summer freshmen, I believe, enrolled like this past week. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they're starting summer camp soon. Jeez. So, yeah, a few months away. Okay. Yeah, week zero is like August 23rd, I believe. Mm -hmm. August 23rd or 24th. Yeah. All right. We got NBA playoffs. Missed quite a bit, actually. NBA conference finals happened. Let's give our little uh, minute summary on the Eastern Conference finals. If if we can even do that. What would you Uh, say about the Eastern Conference finals? The Pacers had a chance. They gave it their all. (laughs) They fought hard. They need to work on their final couple minutes in games. Yeah, they couldn't close a game. Because they had leads in like three of the games or something. Yeah. And they end up losing all those games. I don't know. It's just, it was kind of sad because I thought they had a chance to make it a series. And as soon as they failed like game two and they lost again late in the game, I was like, it's over. And it immediately was. So we never even had to see if Kristaps Porzingis could play or not. He didn't have to. Celtics swept them, put them under the rug. And now Kristaps should be healthy for the NBA Finals, um, which is interesting. And we'll get into the breakdown when we get to the actual NBA Finals. Um, The only thing that I would have to say, I guess, about the Pacers is they're going to be a weird team moving forward. They are. Because... Like, I don't know exactly what they need. I don't know if they just need to keep building as this this team because, like, Andrew Nemhard came on pretty good in the You're playoffs. You're going to have to pay Andrew Nemhard. Yeah, which is weird. You are going to have to pay him because he became a better player in the playoffs. Yeah. And I don't think it's just a fluke mm-hmm. like Miles Turner might be. Right. So they have Tyrese Halliburton, Andrew Nemhard. Pascal Siakam, Miles Pascal Turner. Pascal Siakam also played very well. Yeah. And then that just becomes like the question of a lot of these teams. Like, is that good enough? Yeah. They traded for Bruce Brown. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there. Yep. Didn't see him. TJ McConnell was fantastic. Mm-hmm. They got it. They're keeping him up, of course. Uh, Ben Shepard, shooter off the bench. He was a rookie. 
Mm-hmm. He did well in the playoffs. Obi Toppin played all right. Yeah, they it, they kind of are in a situation where they probably should just keep building. Mm-hmm. Maybe swap around a few spots for a, a few more veterans. But you made it to the Eastern Conference Finals, like yeah, with this young of a team that is nowhere near like actually being a contender. Mm-hmm. They, that was impressive. Yeah. Celtics kind of took care of business. Not much to even say there. Uh, I think like Jalen Brown had a really good series. Um, even better than Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum kind of picked it back Num- up a little numbers bit. wise. He had a really good series, but Jalen Brown was like, yeah, yeah, the aggressive guy, right? So Celtics moving on to the NBA Finals once again. Um, can they get over the hump this time? We'll see. The more exciting finals was the Western Conference Finals. We had the young Timberwolves taking on. I mean, the the Mavs team is pretty young now. They've yeah. gotten a lot yeah, younger. Luke and Kyrie are the only battle tested guys really on that team. Yeah. And a lot of their young guys stepped up. Um uh what was I gonna say? Oh, the the thing that I keep bringing up is I cannot um, I can't believe how much like PJ Washington has changed this team. Yeah. It's wild that he's just turned into like this stretch four that's just knocking down threes. It makes you wonder what type of value those the, those teams that have no hope, that seem to have no hope and are just bad, mm-hmm. what can you get from those teams? Like Daniel Gafford and P- Christoph Porzingis yeah. were starting for the Washington <laughs> Wizards last year, mm-hmm. and now they're going against each other in the finals. Yeah. it It's wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And then, I don't know. Do you want to talk about the Timberwolves? We can they, start talking about the Timberwolves. Because they were, they were the hype team going into this. I think they beat a better team when they beat Denver. Mm-hmm. Denver was, I think that's the matchup that would have been like a knockdown drag out probably seven games. Mm-hmm. Luka versus Jokic. Yeah. <clears throat> but Anthony Edwards went up to another level. Carl Anthony Towns was hitting shots. They were playing all-time defense. And they just hit a, they, they went on a heater in that series. Mm-hmm. And Denver just, they got knocked down and took too many punches and couldn't recover. And they, their bench wasn't deep enough. Mm-hmm. But their youth showed in this series. Yeah. Anthony Edwards didn't shoot well for most of the time. Mm-hmm. Cat couldn't hit the side of a building <laughs> for most of the series. Like, their one win was the time he shot well. Yeah, Rudy Gobert was invisible. Mm-hmm. He, the, he went back to what people criticized him for in Utah for years. Right. Now, part of it is he's he's no threat, like, with lobs. Yeah. Which is not all his fault. Mm-hmm. But Dallas is kind of scoring at will, taking advantage of him in mismatches and picking rolls. Yeah. And he's giving you nothing on offense. Right. What what do you say about Rudy Gobert in that series? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's easier for him, for a guy like Rudy Gobert, to guard someone – like Jokic at times, yeah. obviously Jokic is going to get his, but Jokic obviously isn't as athletic. He's more yeah. of a skill. Over a seven-game series, you can figure out ways to kind of contain right. Jokic if whereas, you really go bare. Whereas the Mavericks have a lot more athletic bigs. Derek Lively yeah. is a young spring chicken, jumps all over the place. Rudy Gobert was on his toes almost this entire series. Yep. Just then, backing up and backing up. And then again, like I said, P.J. Washington spreading the floor so much – just creates a lot more havoc and Rudy Gobert has to do a lot more um, playing off his man and leaving his guy to help. Um, so it just makes it a tougher job for him, I think, overall. Um, and I, I'm just surprised. That, I'll say it. I've been kind of a Mavericks hater for a little bit. Um, not that I don't believe in the talent, but I just had a feeling that like Luca was never going to be able to get over the hump. For some reason, I who just knew felt, that Kyrie was what he needed to do it? Yeah, and again, Kyrie and, and a supporting cast that made sense. Yeah, but again, Kyrie shows up in big games. Yeah, he had some big games in this series, um, and he's just he's kind of revitalized his career a little bit. Not that it ever went away. It, it just it got a lot of muddled because of off the court stuff. Yeah, and I yeah. I like. Almost, I'm rooting for Kyrie at this point, which is wild. I am I, too, honestly. I've never been a Kyrie fan, 
Obviously, he's one of the best ball handlers yeah. of all time. But his reputation off the court, honestly, isn't bad either. Right. Like, he's known as one of the, like, best people yeah. in the NBA off the court. He's just very outspoken about his opinions. Exactly. And if, if you don't agree with his, his opinions, then he you're— He stands on what he believes. Yeah, which I already appreciated about him. Like, if, you know, a lot of people take that the wrong way and they like, oh, he shouldn't be spewing his, his thoughts or whatever. I always take the approach of, like, you know, if, if you're going to say it, just stand by it. And that's what he's always done. So I've always uh, respected him for that. But I just, I don't know. I thought he was kind of a, a kind of a weird guy. And maybe he is. But I like the way that he's kind of revitalized things. And it's almost like, again, like I said, it, it makes me want to root for him to a certain degree. So that's pretty exciting to see. Um, and then Luca, he played really good in the series. Listen, that, that closeout. That twenty in the first half, mm-hmm. that that shot making ability is some of the best. Like, it it seemed like he could not miss, and he knew it. Yeah. After his first two shots went in, his first two threes went in, and then he took the one from the logo, mm-hmm. and it just splashed. It's like he just got a bounce in him. Like his swagger was on ten, yeah. and everything he threw up was just it was it was water. It was crazy to watch. Mm-hmm. And they like the Timberwolves didn't have any answers like you know in the previous series Jaden McDaniels was talked about as like the big defender and that you couldn't couldn't go by him and I think Luca got him a couple times and like just made him look silly and I was like it's just wild like to this day I know we've seen Luca for a few years now but to this day like it's it's similar to Jokic but I, I guess Jokic makes more sense because he has a high release he's taller but like the way that Luca is able to get open and get these shots off just is mind boggling. His his pace, it, it's incredible to watch. Seeing his pace be too like, it confuses all defenders. Mm-hmm. Like everybody with high level athleticism, and they're stronger and they jump higher and they're faster. Mm-hmm. I can guard this dude. Yeah, he has a few. He goes between the legs. He has a few step backs. Mm-hmm. He he dribbles slow. He's not getting past me. Yeah, and then he scores and scores, and he bodies you, and he hits a three in your face, and then it's like, what? What am I supposed to do? Yeah, and, and then the, you're mentally done. And the only other player that we've ever seen that's kind of like that is like a Paul Pierce, but Luca's like I, extreme, I used to hate watching Paul Pierce I when I was too. younger. I hated it. I I did too. <laughs> um, but like Luca is like an extreme version of that, yeah. and it's just it's crazy. It's it's cool to watch, but it's it's weird at times. Um. Before we move on to the finals, I'll, I have a few more thoughts. Were you about to say something else? Uh, the only thing I was going to say is the only problem that I have with Luca right now is he's very vocal and very whiny. It's not as bad as it was during the regular season. It's still noticeable. Yeah. But it was bad during the regular season. Right. So, you know, for me in that series, it was like seeing the two, like, two biggest stars in basketball on the come up right now with Anthony Edwards and Luca either of those guys could be the face of the league. And right now I would, I would rather have Anthony Edwards be the face of the league. That's just a me personal thing, but Listen, there are a lot of fans saying they want an American to take over again. <laughs> it is, it and is it, what it is. Like me, the, the Europeans even, have taken over. Yeah. But to lot. me, it's not even that. Like I've always been a fan of Dirk is one of my favorite players of all time. But to me, it's just, I like the mentality for yeah, Anthony Edwards. The old Edwards. school two guard. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I like that he's gritty. He's not. He's also not afraid to say what he wants, but he just puts his head down and goes to work. So, interesting. Yeah, but Whatever um, you were gonna say. I feel like when it comes to the Timberwolves, their fan base should be beyond excited. Like, this is almost an A plus season. Yeah, this is the most successful season you've had since KG mm-hmm. in two thousand four. You 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 bring back pretty much everything and you're you're fine. They won a game in the conference finals, Wasn't, exactly because they didn't have a win in the conference finals or something like that, right? I think they got swept by the Lakers. Yeah, because yeah. that was like the whole story 0-3-0-4. is they'd never won in the conference finals. Yeah, but I think there's one move that they need to make if they want to get over the hump. Mike Conley, his leadership was huge. Mm-hmm. He's a big reason why they made this run. And his consistent shooting helps a, a ton. 
I think you need a high level playmaker next to Anthony Edwards. Mm-hmm. You can go with the big swing of trading Cat and maybe somebody else for a guy like Trey Young from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. You put a high level All Star point guard next to Anthony Edwards. Trey Young is a high level lob thrower and a guy that likes to play in the pick and roll and could get Rudy Gobert more incorporated into it. There's another option that involves the Pistons. No, oh, no. And this would help in turning things around, but boy, Pistons fans, they would have to get over it. Mm. But at this point, I would almost be happier if this dude was in a winning situation. <laughs> Putting a big point guard that can play, make, and score next to Anthony Edwards. What if the Timberwolves traded for Cade? <laughs> What what if I think it it could work? I just and I think it would it would unleash something even more in their defense. Having a six eight point guard that he would have a whole different mentality playing for the Timberwolves mm-hmm. with those those young guys that have been to a Western Conference Finals know how to win now are well coached and I don't know man it would be a bigger swing than Trey yeah but it's buying on a guy with more size that could be a potential really good defender and can play make and can score next to Anthony Edwards. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't hate it. The hard part is what do the Pistons get back in that kind of scenario? And hmm. yeah, obviously I would want cat and yeah, it cat would probably be the main piece of either trade. I would almost want this to be a draft night trade because I would want, us knowing that Cade was going to be gone so we could account for that in the draft. Get Cat. Obviously, we'd. I think we'd... Mm. I would want a pick, but I don't know if they would give us a pick in that scenario necessarily. Yeah. Um, I brought this up just but I, I knew it was a, no, a, a, pretty, a pretty good topic to but, jump into. If you need like at least one other role guy. Oh, yeah, they're not giving up Nas Reed. They're not giving no. up uh Jaden McDaniels. Right. But mm. I mean, uh, this isn't the Troy Weaver era anymore. We don't have to invest in guys yeah. like Emmanuel Miller. Just to, hey, he's a young guy with potential. Let's see what he has. Yeah. We we don't have to do that anymore. Right. But if we could get Cat and maybe some pick or maybe man, who is their Who's on their bench? That... Listen, you you don't love them. I would take slow mo for half a season. I know. I would take Kyle Anderson Ugh. for half a season. I, I I take it. I would take it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I ruin the Did I ruin no. the segment? But if 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 again if we did that, then that allows us to draft maybe a shooting guard because then maybe you, well I don't know. Again, it, it depends on how you view Jaden Ivey, whether you view him as a point guard or a shooting guard in the NBA. Um, I think I would rather him be more of a point guard and be able to drive and kick. So then if we get, then maybe we draft Dalton connect for our two guard. It's a, I it's, wouldn't it's hate a, it. It's a hell of a scenario. Uh, the yeah. only, the, the best part about that. If whole you thing, trade Cade, you want to get a haul back though. Yeah. Cat and a bunch of picks and right. Yeah. Which I don't think you're going to get um, because cat has still, good value but if it means bumping beef stew out of the starting lineup i think i'm okay with it what if it's if it's kate and beef stew uh, yeah i'd be okay yeah, with then that they, then they get a power forward and yeah. a young guard yeah it's Anthony Edwards. i'd be okay with that and then uh makes our draft maybe a little easier because yeah they they need a power forward that's tougher than cat yeah because he and just it, he just wants to stand outside at the three-point line and maybe they just put nas reed into the starting role true although i it, I feel like his role is best yeah. as like th- he's the guy coming off the bench mm-hmm. and he's very comfortable in having like free reign right. coming off the bench. Yeah. It's an interesting point that I never really thought of. Yeah. But I I think they need an, another point guard and a guy that's at a higher level than aging Mike Conley. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Mike Conley should be there more as just the leadership role at this point Yeah, and diminish his playing time. Cause yeah, but every, all their other pieces to keep what you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I've seen people talk about is like, um, who was it? 
Oh, <laughs> it was Nick Young. <laughs> but he was talking about, and I, I agree, the Timberwolves could also just use, like, one more, like, gritty guy off the bench or something, like a TJ McConnell um, of that kind of nature, which would be interesting. I think he brought up Jordan Poole, but... Uh, I'm good. N- no. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good on the Poole party. Yeah. Keep it in Washington. I get that maybe you could want another shooter for that team to replace Mike Conley's minutes, but that's the only other thing I could think of. So... Yeah. Unfortunately, I, in, a, in a winning situation, Jordan Poole maybe could become himself again, but right. that's too risky. Yeah. yeah, take a little pressure off of him again. Um, but yeah, so good season, but unfortunate that we don't get to see the Timberwolves in the finals. We thought maybe they could make some some special run, but it looks like they should be good for the future in some capacity. I, I feel like they're gonna fall off a little bit next year. Um, no, nothing crazy. I just don't. I think. They had such a good season this year. There's going to be a little bit of a dip, but I think when they get back to the playoffs, they're going to be that team that nobody wants to see in yeah. the playoffs just because of the way they play. Um, so that sets our um, ep, bleh, sets up our NBA <laughs> Finals to be the Mavericks taking on the Celtics. These are the teams that, I, uh, I mean, the Celtics, everybody kind of felt like they would just make their way to the Finals. The Mavericks, again, like I said, I'm very surprised that they made it. So, where do you see this matchup going? And that's tomorrow. Tomorrow. I tomorrow forgot. night. <laughs> it starts. I think it comes down to the health of Chris Apps Porzingis. If he's unhealthy and ends up playing like two or three games, I'm going to take Dallas. Mm. I think Luka and Kyrie are not afraid of going into Boston at all and just snatching away their hearts. Yeah. They're not afraid. Chris Alps Porzingis needs to be out there, first of all, because we didn't talk about the kind of the breakout of Derek Lively, mm-hmm. who is becoming like the next Tyson Chandler right before our eyes. Yeah. And it's even better because Tyson Chandler is still like working within the Dallas organization and practicing with Derek Lively mm-hmm. to like help him get better, which is cool that those guys come back and help the young players. But yeah. him just shot 100% in the Western Conference Finals, almost averaged a double double. Mm-hmm. catching lobs, mm-hmm. playing hard defense, Daniel Gafford coming off the bench and doing the same thing. Kristaps Porzingis, I think he has even more of an ability than Carl Anthony Towns Yeah, to go out there and bring those defenders out to, to the three-point line. You have high-level drivers of the ball and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Mm-hmm. I think you only ha- really had one of those with Anthony Edwards for the Timberwolves. You got two all-star level guys that can attack the rim with Kristaps Porzingis out to the three, to the three point line, they could get them easy buckets. They could get them and, and ones, and that could help them get open threes too. When they with them keeping the ball moving, because mm-hmm. we know like they like they like to take a ton of threes. Right. So if Porzingis is healthy, I think that opens their entire offense. Mm-hmm. And I will take Boston in that series okay. if he's fully healthy. Yeah, I think my biggest X factor for let's just st- stick to the Celtics for now. Um, I think the biggest X factor for the Celtics is actually probably, and it's not like the biggest, but I think it could be Jalen Brown because he's going to have to probably guard Luca. Yeah. So we've seen it in the past where at times Jalen Brown, you know, if he's playing hard defense, he struggles on the offensive side at times. So can he get it done on both sides of the ball where he has to slow down Luca enough, but he also, also has to score enough, which I guess it could play into your your Kristaps thing that if Jalen Brown is playing such hard defense, Kristaps picks up the slack on the offensive side. But I think Jalen Brown is going to need to have a good series on both sides of the ball for them to really just pull away with this, and they could win quite easily, to be honest. Um, Jason Tatum, this is this could be his career defining moment, and yeah. I know he's only what twenty four, twenty five now. Um, when you've made as many deep runs in the playoffs as he has yeah. at his young age, the youth excuse kind of goes away. Right. And he's had some poor performances at times. Throughout so, these playoffs, he's had some poor performances. Yeah. This has not been his best playoff stretch. Right. And he's had some of those in the past, too, and that's kind of been his biggest knock so far. So people are trying to figure out, is he the guy or is he you know, just below that level of superstar? Um, so it's a big 
deal for him. Who do you think on the Mavericks side is the biggest factor? Kyrie. Yeah, I think I, I think I have to agree. It's Kyrie. I mean, I think we know what Luke is going to do for the most part. We know what he's going to do with Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford in the pick and roll game. Mm-hmm. You expect guys like Tim Hardaway and Jaden Hardy and uh, I forgot Green's first name, the two guard number eight that comes off the bench. But him too, all those guys that just wait and catch and shoot Mm -hmm. and come off screens and shoot, they're all going to play their three and D role. Kyrie has to be locked in and playing at a high level. These these whole finals Mm -hmm. for them to win. Now they got defenders. They strapped up in the off season for this reason. They got Derek White. They got Drew Holiday. They can throw Jalen Brown at him if they want to. Mm-hmm. Even Tatum could try and guard him if they want to, because they're the, like that level of versatile defenders. Mm-hmm. So they have at least four guys to keep switching and try and keep on Kyrie. He's the most skilled player in NBA history. Yeah, it's kind of like a unanimous uh, opinion at this point that no guard or player has ever had as much in his tool bag as Kyrie does. Mm-hmm. He has to kind of like pull off what he pulled off in Cleveland. Yeah. Again. Like Luca is in that LeBron role. He's going to control the game. He's going to score when he needs to, get the assists, get the rebounds. Mm-hmm. Kyrie, when it's your turn to go, you have to go. And there there can't be a, this is the finals. There can't be a drop off. Yeah. We can't have the like 11 tw- 11 point games, 12 point games. We need you to score above 20 points a game here. Preferably like 25, 26. Right. And I think that's what he can and most likely will do for most of the series. Mm -hmm. And if Kyrie is locked in like that, it's going to be really tough. Yeah. It's going to be really tough for the Celtics. Mm -hmm. Because then Tatum and Brown both have to be on point. Yeah. You know, the other kind of wild thing that I thought about now that you just brought up the Cavaliers thing, they're built like those Cavaliers. Like, yeah. like you said, Luka is kind of the LeBron role. Kyrie's playing his role. P.J. Washington has become, like, the Kevin, Kevin Love, Love role. Yeah. Everybody then, else, shoot the ball when we pass it to you. And then, like, Anderson and, Vergeau yeah. was kind of a pest. Uh, uh, he was, he was, it was Tristan Thompson. Was it Tristan yeah, Thompson? Yeah, it wasn't Anderson okay. Vergeau. Okay. I can't, I can't remember who else they had as a center because Mozgov was 2015. He, was, I don't think he was on the 2016 team. Tristan Thompson was the big, I believe. I don't know who else was the center on that team. Um, who was the backup big for the Cavs in 2016? Yeah, they're saying Timothy Mozgov was the starter. Okay. Uh, when they oh, so let's see when they won the championship, was he on that team? I don't remember him being there. Verzhal might have been hurt then. Yeah, because he was on the, wasn't Verzhal was on the roster, but yeah, I don't remember him playing. In yeah, that they had Tristan Thompson. <clears throat> I mean, that's even more so. Like just a defensive specialist kind of yeah. guy, and this is Tristan fresh off of his big contract, <laughs> right? Because of how he played in the then, 2015 playoffs. And then on that team, like you have like J.R. Smith, Richard Jefferson, Joe Harris, yeah, like Channing Fry shooting threes, like yeah. shooters on the sides, which is like your Tim Hardaways and things like that. So it's a it's a pretty good comparison, I would I would say, um, to the roster that Kyrie's been on before. So yeah, that it's interesting. Um. I mean, the other thing you brought up too, I I always I keep forgetting that the Celtics have Drew Holiday on yeah. that roster. He could be another big X factor for them, just because, like you said, he's most likely going to be guarding Kyrie. This Al Horford might be a little bit of an X factor because, mm-hmm. like him against Derek Lively, he could just outsmart him and yeah. just be strong mm-hmm. and and stop him from like rolling to the rim over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah, minimize the um. Uh, Boston's backup center, number 40. The really tall guy. <laughs> really doesn't do much out there. Uh, I don't know by numbers. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know their bench very well. He's very forgettable. Okay. I forget a lot of names, but he's very forgettable. The only yeah, He plays spot minutes and doesn't really do a lot. Because the only backup that I ever think of is Maxi Kleba. He's like a shooter, so he's yeah. got some value there. Um, The other thing, too, like, can P.J. Washington – continue his stretch because they're going to need him to knock down threes and cause Kristaps to get out of the paint because Kristaps isn't the greatest defender on the perimeter. He's not bad, but he's much better 
in the paint as a defender. So if PJ Washington can kind of spread the floor that way as well, like that helps the Mavericks a lot too. So I don't know. I think this could be a really good series. The more that we kind of talk about it and look at it. Um, I don't know. What are your predictions? The past few days I've been thinking Boston in six, Mm -hmm. but the more I think, I I think it's going to be so hard for Boston to get wins in Dallas. And I have faith in Luca just going crazy in Boston. So, it, if Porzingis is healthy, I'm going Celtics in seven. Mm. If he's not, I'm going Mavericks in seven. Okay. Actually, I will go Mavericks in six if Porzingis isn't healthy. Yeah. Because I really think Luca and Kyrie will be locked in for this series. Mm-hmm. If Porzingis is healthy, I'm taking Boston. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, I keep going, kind of going back and forth too, because I could see it where like the Celtics win in like five, something wild. Like if they just get out to a strong start, but then I see the side of like what you're saying with the Mavericks where Kyrie and Luca just go crazy and they could win. I think they would win in six as well. I'm going to go. Maybe just for the narrative, I'm going to go with the Mavericks in six and just defining Jason Tatum as not that guy, <laughs> unfortunately. And I'm not yeah. trying to be like just mean to Jason Tatum or something. I mean, you have a point. It it would really emphasize the prime of his career more than anything. Yeah. Because if you have this stretch of not being able to get – he's gotten over the hump getting to the finals. Right. But if you lose two finals – and you come up small individually in these finals mm-hmm. against a fifth seed Dallas who has two, two superstar level guys. Yeah. But then it becomes like between 27 and 30, what have you got? Mm-hmm. When you hit that prime where you're a veteran and you're expected to be at a high level almost all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And when the franchise is bent over backwards to get every bit of help that you can exactly. get. He's the, he is the most privileged and least the the most privileged and the least I wouldn't say the least productive least accomplished yeah he is the most privileged and the least accomplished young star in the league yeah and when a chance like he have he had a very good chance to be that guy as again I bring up the face of the franchise or the face of the NBA and that's slowly fading away potentially if he doesn't get it done here. Now, if he gets it done and in like a, a meaningful fashion, he's right back in that conversation. But if he doesn't, he's right back to, you know, fading away as, you know, this NBA superstar that we all thought he could be. And not that he fully isn't, but there's just that different echelon, you know, that you talk about when you have somebody that's won a championship and somebody that doesn't. We see it all the time with Shaq and Charles Barkley on TNT. Shaq gets to talk all this crap because Charles doesn't have any championships. Yeah. Whereas if Charles had championships, I mean, Charles was dominant back in the day. If Charles was the only person that beat Jordan in the 90s. Right. That would have meant everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that Phoenix team was probably the best team to go against those Bulls. Right. So it, it I think this matchup brings a lot of interesting things. Whereas, like, we have Kyrie trying to revitalize his career. We have Luka and Jason Tatum kind of fighting for who can be that guy that wins a championship first. Who's the official top five potential top three player? Yeah. And the other thing is now it just makes Luka's draft class look terrible. (laughs) Listen, the two ahead of him, DeAndre Ayton and Marvin Bagley. (laughs) And the Hawks trading. It's insane in retrospect. And the Hawks trading to get Trey Young instead of Luka. Listen. Do you remember what your thoughts on Luca were in that draft? I did not know enough about him. So I was I didn't either. I was in that boat of I'm not sure. Like um, I, I knew he was like the European prodigy that yeah. was dominating the Euro League as a teenager. Yeah. And that means something. Mm-hmm. But yeah. The one thing I did know though is I did not believe in Marvin Bagley. 
So at least I got that. I right. believed. At least I got that. Partly because right. I was a Duke fan. Yeah. And I I loved. He was lefty, athletic. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I also didn't think that Trey Young was, like, that good. I guess. And he's kind of proven me wrong. Um. But at the same time. Um. I don't know. Chris, I will say, had the most faith in Luca. Listen, there and were. He's been on it. There since was day a one. like. There was a specific like cultish crowd. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, how's nobody seeing this? Mm-hmm. Like Bill Simmons was like the big one in media that was telling everybody, you can't miss on this guy. Yeah. And then there were fans online that were like, this is crazy. Like he's the number one pick. Mm-hmm. And a that's one of the few that Chris absolutely hit a home run. <laughs> yeah. All all of the big limbs he goes out on. Yeah. That's now, the one where he hit it on the nail. Now I do think that Chris said at one point that Luca would be NBA MVP, and he hasn't reached. He hasn't that. done it yet. So, he, I, maybe the was one... he was he top three finish this year? I can't uh, remember. I'd have to look. I don't know. It was Jokic and Shea, wasn't it? Shea was up there. Was it Jokic Shea? And yeah, I'd have to look online to see. But yeah, he deserved to be top three. He's that. Yeah, he's been that good. Yeah. So some good storylines about this NBA Finals. Um, again, kind of actually excited to watch. Because I didn't, I didn't watch much of the conference finals because they weren't that exciting. Watched yeah, a couple of the Mavericks. I watched the game one of these two conference finals, and I didn't watch a game after. Yeah, um, Mavericks Timberwolves was okay, um, but there was a couple blowouts in there. So I'm hoping that this this finals is really good. Um, again, I, I would just like to see the Mavericks make it back to the championship or get a championship. I'm always a little salty when the Celtics get back because you know they have enough championships. Um, I know it's a different roster, but the other thing that I, I, I thought of too is like the Pistons now have, and I know we're not supposed to bring up the Pistons, but I brought up the Pistons. I think so about it. Fine. I think about it because of the Celtics, the Celtics drought from, you know, their last championship to when they won in what? Oh, eight. Yeah. Was it was as, like 1987 to like yeah, 2008. The Pistons have now surpassed that time frame. That is crazy. Oh, my God. And I thought uh, about that not too long ago. Because the Pistons, you know, they won the championship in 2004. So now we're at a 20-year gap. Yeah. Whereas the Celtics, and if you remember, the mid-'90s Celtics, late, early 2000s even, even when they first got yeah. Paul Pierce. It's like Larry, Larry's back was pretty much gone. Yeah. Reggie Lewis was like a borderline all-star. D, D. Williams won the dunk contest. Mm-hmm. And then Paul Pierce got drafted, and then they were awful yeah. for a long time. Listen, we're not we're not going to talk about the um. I've, man, me me forgetting names is insane, but the coach of the Celtics in the mid nineties that was a college coach, Rick. Um, yeah, he's the coach at Saint Rick Patino. Oh yeah, that yeah. era was disgusting. Mm-hmm. They drafted Chauncey Billups and then traded him after like a month. <laughs> yeah, so it just it it's a jealousy thing. That you know, one of the winningest, winningest franchises were able to pull them themselves out of the depths, yeah. get a championship in two thousand eight. In you know, that's a twenty year span. The Pistons are now at that span, but back in like two thousand six, two thousand seven, you were seeing the Celtics build to get to that oh eight team. Well, a little bit, uh, barely. <laughs> yeah, because it was All Star Paul Pierce, like Gerald Green, yeah. rookie Rajon Rondo. Mm-hmm. Al Jefferson, like, it was a bunch of young dudes that nobody knew about in Paul Pierce. Yeah. And, and then the Danny Ainge was like, enough. Yeah. We were, we're getting this done. Mm-hmm. And then he made the big trade. Yeah. So the Pistons have now hit that gap of 20 years. And uh, Listen, at least Boston had some really good seasons in between that stretch to now. The Pistons have, not, have nothing. Nothing. <laughs> like, that's my nothing. whole point. It makes it feel terrible. That's the more I think, yeah. Oh, Jesus, man. <clears throat> so, yeah, I I don't have anything else. Is know. um is Marvin Bagley over Luca the modern day Sam Bowie over Jordan? Uh, it could be. I mean, because in retrospect, it is so bad. Yeah, it is like James Wiseman was number one, right? That was DeAndre Ayton. Oh, it was Ayton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was DeAndre Ayton. James Wiseman went number one in the COVID draft. Yeah, that's right. I was like, that's too early. DeAndre Aiden, Marvin Bagley. Luca. Trey Young. Yeah. 
Yeah. DeAndre Ayton probably still goes number one in most scenarios because of how everything ju- like yeah, was put up against each other. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty rough. Absolutely nuts. Pretty rough. But you can say that about a lot of drafts, so at the end of the day. But Luca could be become one of the the greats. So yeah. Who knows? We'll see. How many minutes do we have left? Uh like four. Listen, shouts out to Henry Allenson. Shouts out to <laughs> Luke Kennard. Shouts out to Stanley Johnson. Who else? Uh, KCP, you played well for us. Andre Drummond, Greg, Greg Monroe. Monroe. Shouts out to Chris's guy, Peyton Siva. Uh, Chris's other guy, Austin Day. <sighs> <laughs> See, this is where Chris's takes just haven't always worked out. That's why it just reminded me of the, the Pistons draft history. Mm-hmm. And, oh my God, yeah, Luke Kennard over Donovan Mitchell. That one, I know it looks egregious in retrospective, but I, I wanted Luke Kennard at the top. <laughs> right, like I was cool. I'm so with it. embarrassed. Oh my god, I was cool with it. But. I did not realize how good Donovan Mitchell was. Like mm-hmm. they played against Michigan in the NCAA tournament. Michigan beat them. Donovan Mitchell had like 20. I was like, he's a he's a good, really good college two guard. Yeah, that's all I thought. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's all right. We'll figure it out one day. Will we? Maybe. Will we? Again, we'll, we will schedule this Pistons episode. And Is we will Trajan get, Langdon the savior? I don't know about that, but <laughs> uh, I am curious to see who we're going to try to bring in as a GM. I don't know who's out there. Again, that's why when Chris comes on, we'll have to figure it all out. But hopefully, again, by then we should have a GM and we can kind of assess the situation. But Who is your favorite Pistons draft pick? Like, of all time? Ever. <laughs> Ever? Uh, you can't say Tayshaun Prince. Who was your favorite Pistons draft pick ever? I mean, it probably wouldn't have been Tayshaun Prince. Because there were barely any, there were no ones that mattered Man. in the championship era. Who? Amir Johnson was there as a high school kid. He was one of the last high school draft picks. Man. He was a Piston for two years and then got drafted. There's like I mean, fun they got one, traded. Like, the fun ones are like Rodney Stuckey and Jason Maxiel. But... Are those like, you got to pick a favorite. Are those like my favorite? That's what I'll say. You have to pick a favorite of the mess bunch. You got to pick one. Who's your favorite Pistons draft pick? You're saying during the mess? Yes. Oh. That's why in the whole muddled era, what's insane <laughs> since they picked Tayshaun Prince, everything in between draft wise has been horrible. That's over 20 years. Yeah. You go from Tayshaun to Darko. Jason Maxiel worked out, kind of. Right. Like, that's why I said, like, who, who else some, is, some decent yeah. role players. All right, let's, let's. Listen, Ryan Anderson got traded. Chris Middleton got traded. Let's just do this really quick. We got, like, two minutes. Yeah. Um. So, Tayshaun Prince in 2002. Yes. 2003, Darko, Carlos yeah. Delfino, and. Oh, some shoot. Other, some other that's, dude. Carlos is my answer. But yeah, keep going. Well, that's 2003. I forgot Carlos so, got drafted. But that's before the championship, so yeah, we can't yeah, count yeah. that. 2004, we got Ricky Paulding. Who is that? 2005. Oh, my was, God. So, 2005 is Jason Maxiel, Amir Johnson, and Alex Acker. Those two, those first two aren't bad. 06. Not bad at all. Will Blaylock. Oh, Will Blaylock. Then, in 2007, Rodney Stuckey, Aaron Aflalo. Aflalo wasn't a bad pick. But he was I bad for the team. I forgot they drafted Aaron Aflalo. He, he, he didn't he work out He great wasn't for bad the team. for the Pistons. They just didn't want to develop him. Yeah. He wasn't bad for the Pistons. 2008, DJ White and Darren Washington. God. God. Now, again, these were good teams, so we didn't have Is that Virginia Tech, picks. Darren Washington? Um, I believe it is. Geez. Yes, it is. And Indiana's Derek. Derek. What was Joe Dumar smoking? <laughs> DJ White and Darren Washington. And then the wild one, too. Ooh. 2009, Austin Day. Did he draft to Jonas Jarebko? Was that a draft pick? Yes. Okay. Dewan Summers, Jonas Jarebko. Dewan Summers. Technically, Chase Budinger, but he went to Houston. Chase Budinger just made the Olympic volleyball team. Yeah. Congratulations to Chase Budinger. Um, 2010, Greg Monroe. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about Tariqa Moose. White. Did you just say Tariqa? Okay, move yes, on. Tariqa White, move on. Um, Brandon Knight. I hated it. Did they draft Tony Chris, Mitchell? Chris loved Brandon Knight. Uh, Yeah, they did. Wow. Who was in the Tony 2011 Mitchell, draft North pick? Texas. 2011? Kemba that was, Walker. That was, that was the Kemba Walker draft. 
It was. Because we picked yeah. Brandon Knight one pick before Kemba Walker. That was the one I was mad at. <laughs> Joe Dumars. That was the one I – Joe Dumars. Because that was Kemba Walker, Clay Thompson, Kawhi Leonard, Busevich. In the 2012 draft was Andre Drummond? Yes. The 2013 draft is when he, Joe Dumars said he wouldn't draft Trey Burke because they needed a two-guard, but they didn't need a two uh, Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Andre Drummond. 2013 was KCP. 2012 was Chris Middleton. He turned out great. Yeah. Not for the Pistons. <laughs> um, 2013, KCP, Tony yeah. Mitchell, Peyton Siva. 2014, Spencer Dinwiddie. We only had a second-round pick. Yeah, they traded him, and he got better. 2015, Stanley Johnson. We liked the pick. Turned out terrible. Darren Hilliard. 2016. Well, 2016. Um, Henry Ellenson. Okay, yeah, here. Well, I, I thought uh, with, Bruce. I thought Bruce Brown was twenty sixteen too, or was he seventeen? Um, twenty eighteen. Oh, wow. Okay. But Henry Ellenson was followed by Malik Beasley, Karis Levert. Not a great draft class, anyways. Pascal Siakam went twenty second, but mm. I can't blame him. Uh, twenty seventeen, Luke Kennard. Twenty eighteen, Bruce Brown. Twenty nineteen, Seku. You remember Seku Gamboya? I saw him at Target. <laughs> Shouts out to Seku Dumbuya. 2020, Killian Hayes. 2021, uh, Cade Cunningham. Shouts out to Cade. Jade uh, Nivey, Asar Thompson. I don't have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Luke Kennard. That was a fun exercise. It might have been Luke Kennard or Jason Maxey. Yeah. All right, we've gone over now. And again, we've <laughs> reminisced about terrible Pistons draft picks. So uh, we'll wait for that big episode where we can vent about everything. But for now, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. I'm buying a Carlos Delfino jersey. I need to feel something.